Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started this evening, let's uh, make sure we are prepared spiritually for our study of God's Word. Scripture teaches that when we sin as believers, we don't lose our salvation, but we do uh, lose our fellowship, our rapport with God, and the ongoing sanctifying ministry of God the Holy Spirit is uh, shut down, even though He continues to work in our lives in other areas. But we need to confess our sins, and then God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to make sure you're ready to focus, prepared spiritually for the study of God's Word. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for all the many ways in which you have provided for us, but above all, because you have provided us with what we need to know in order to live life to glorify you. You have given us what we need to know in order to properly understand reality, in order to perceive things and interpret the events in the world around us according to your word, and that as we study your word and we learn the many uh, promises that you have provided for us, we realize that as we live on the basis of those promises, it focuses our attention on not on present realities and present circumstance, but on that future hope that we live today in light of eternity and we're not living just for today. And there is a reason and a purpose that even though we may not understand it, there are reasons and purposes behind the experiences that we encounter on a day-to-day basis. Father, we pray for those in this congregation who are uh, struggling or dealing with health problems uh, at this time. There are a number of those. You know who they are. And we just pray for them and that you would give their doctors wisdom and courage, strength, strengthen them, and that as they face those struggles, that they would do so on the basis of your word. Continue to pray also for uh, Jim Myers and the problems he's having uh, in the last week or two with uh, blood pressure, that you would uh, enable the doctors to get that stabilized and that that will not be a limiting factor in his ministry. Father, we pray for our study tonight, that we would be encouraged, strengthened by your word, and that this would refresh us from the, the discouragements of life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Hebrews 11, but we're not going to be there for very long, so don't turn there to start off. I'll just remind you of where we were last uh, Wednesday night after we finished with our uh, <coughs> reflections on the pre-trib rapture uh, study group meeting and what we learned about, a little bit about our history in terms of the history that's behind the growth of the uh, Bible church side of the evangelical uh, movement. Hebrews 11.20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, we looked at this last time. In terms of the simple statement of Hebrews, the writer is simply going to another uh, example from the Old Testament, from the patriarchs, where he's looking at the testimony this time of Isaac and his blessing of Jacob and blessing of Esau concerning, that is, in relationship to things to come. That was the focal point of those of, of the blessing. Now, last time, we looked at those blessings, rehearsed, reviewed the story of Isaac and Esau and their birth, I mean, Jacob and Esau and their birth, 
and the fact that uh, Esau was the older, Jacob was the younger, but in God's plan, the older serves the younger rather than the other way around, which is the normal human uh, procedure, emphasizing works or position where God is do- not doing it according to the way man normally uh, looks at things, giving a certain amount of, of uh, priority to who is born first under the uh, rule or law of primogenitor. And so the older was to serve the younger. And God had announced this as the two uh, babies were struggling inside the womb of, of uh, Rebekah. God had announced that the older would serve the younger. And so that was the promise of God. The problem is that you get number two child coming out uh, a little bit late, Jacob, and you get the episode where he's trying to grab the heel, or at least it looks that way as he's uh, coming out of the womb. And so he's known as the, the, the heel grabber. And he has this character. It's a, actually, it's a family trait because, as we'll see tonight and as we've seen in our study in Genesis, this, he was just a, an amateur compared to his uncle Laban. Uncle Laban was a uh, real manipulator and someone who was always uh, getting the upper hand on everybody. And he was the ultimate trickster, whereas uh, uh, Jacob was just the uh, just a learner. But God has another plan for Jacob other than being uh, the manipulator and the trickster. But this characterizes Jacob. It is, it is used and it depicts uh, the trend of his sin nature and the flaw of his character that he's out there trying to manipulate, trying to uh, maneuver God, trying to get the blessing to happen rather than learning to wait upon the Lord. He wants to uh, move God's timetable up. And I know nobody here has a problem with waiting on the Lord, but a lot of people have problems waiting on the Lord and learning to orient to God's plan and to God's timetable. And we want God's plan, we want patience, and we want it right now, if not yesterday. So that's uh, that was Jacob's problem, and God has to train him and teach him. But before he gets to that point, we see that the issues here all come back to the Abrahamic promise. Now remember, promise was a major uh, <clears throat> part of our uh, study in Hebrews chapter 11. The promise is future. Promise indicates something that hasn't been fulfilled either in the present or in the past, and it focuses on something unfulfilled. It is oriented also to hope. That hope has the idea of a confident expectation. The confident expectation of the believer is oriented to the fulfillment of of a promise that God has made. And so hope and promise focus on the future. And so the believer is to be driven and motivated and stabilized in the present because he understands where God is taking him and how God is getting him there and through that through that process. And so we looked at the blessing that God I mean that Isaac uh gave to uh, Jacob uh, of course, this was done under a situation where Jacob had tricked and deceived Isaac. Nevertheless, because of the nature of the blessing as a legal, uh, as, as an aspect of legal inheritance and passing on something, it couldn't be reversed, even though it was under 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 deception. Uh, uh, Jacob had dressed up as if he was Esau. His mother had uh, made a dish that would taste like uh, one of uh, Isaac's favorite dishes that was uh, uh, came from the, from uh, uh, out in the uh, wilderness where Esau would go to hunt. And so they had this elaborate plan to deceive Isaac, and it worked. And so Isaac gives the blessing for Jacob in verses 27 to 29. And he came near and blessed him, that is Isaac, came near to Jacob and blessed him and said, Surely the uh, smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. So he's deceived into thinking that it's Esau because uh, Jacob smelled like Esau. Verse 28, Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you. So he's emphasizing that rulership dimension and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be anyone who curses you and blessed be those 
who bless you. So this is a reiteration of the blessing that God had given to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, and it confirms to Isaac that he is the one he, I mean to uh, Jacob rather, that he is the one, he is the seed through whom this blessing will will pass. And I put Genesis 12, 2, and 3 up at the top because uh, I color-coded some of the phrases there to show the uh, similarity, how the blessing of Jacob uh, carried on that Abrahamic tradition. In contrast, we have the blessing that uh, Isaac had left over to give to Esau. When Esau came in, there's a tremendous amount of drama as Esau realizes how the, not only the birthright, but also the blessing has been uh, ripped off by Jacob. And so he comes to his father and begs his father, isn't there something left? And so Isaac answers him and says, behold, your dwelling should be of the fatness of the earth, indicates a measure of prosperity and of the dew of heaven from above, and uh, by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. Not good news for Esau that he would be serving uh, his brother Jacob. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. And so this doesn't apply directly to Esau per se, but to his descendants looking at Esau and Jacob as the progenitors of two different nations, just as God had said when... uh, uh, he spoke to Rebecca and said, there are two nations struggling inside of your womb. So that's where we stopped last time. But there's one more blessing that uh, Isaac had for Jacob. After this, uh, Esau just absolutely flips out and goes uh, postal, as they say today. And he's threatening Jacob's life, that he is going to kill Jacob. He is just as angry as he can be because he has been so ripped off by his brother the trickster that as Rebecca hears him uh, venting and screaming and yelling, she goes into calls in uh, Jacob and decides to send him away to her brother Laban up near Padana Ram in the north so that uh, Jacob will be protected and so just before he leaves, Isaac calls him in, and we look at, at Isaac's second blessing for Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. So we're going to look at a couple of different things here in Genesis 28, so that's a good chapter to have uh, open in your Bible. Because I think it's important for us to look at the gap between uh, Hebrews 11, 20, and 21 as it pertains to what God is doing in the life of Jacob. So in Genesis 28.1, Isaac called uh, Jacob in and blessed him and charged him. Notice the word blessing again. I've got it highlighted on the slide that there are three times that we have the word blessing used in these four verses, showing that this is the emphasis of this, this section. Isaac called Jacob in and blessed him and charged him and said to him, Uh, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. That's first priority. You have to maintain that separation. Now, this gets is going to get lost, just a foreshadowing of things to come. This idea of separation from the Canaanites gets lost with Jacob's sons, the 12 sons who uh, form the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. They start intermarrying with the Canaanites. But Isaac is still very much concerned that they maintain their, the family maintains a separation from the Canaanites and not become influenced by their by their paganism. So, the first uh, charge is a prohibition: you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. The second is a positive charge to go to Padan Aram in the north, up in what is modern day Syria, up near the border of Syria and Turkey. Go to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel of your mother's father, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you. What does that refer to? That goes back to the seed promise in the Abrahamic covenant that God would make Abraham the father of many nations, and then that would come through the line through Isaac. So may God bless you, make you fruitful, and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham 
to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land, that you may possess. They don't possess it yet. It's future. It is a promise to inherit the land, and they never fully uh, controlled the land that God promised to Abraham in the Old Testament. That's one of those important uh, aspects. Uh, This morning, as I uh, was... Starting my day, I decided to call Jim Myers just to go over last-minute details related to my trip to Kiev, and I had a wrong phone number, and I ended up calling uh, Jim Dumas' apartment, and uh, Bruce Bumgardner answered the phone, and, which was providential because Bruce, he said, I was just thinking about calling you. And because um, he's, he was, he's probably on the, in the air as we speak. He would have left about maybe time is it now? No, he's probably going to the, getting up right now to go to the airport. And um, uh, he just wanted to go over some, some logistical details as well as some details about the class. But there's one student in the class, and we ought to be praying for this young man. I don't have a name for him. He's a nice kid, young guy, but he, somewhere along the line, became influenced by covenant theology. And he uh, is just not, so far no one's been able to convince him of the, uh, of this hard and fast distinction between Israel and the church. And Pastor Bumgardner, just bless his little heart. See, that's what we say in Texas when we're being nice to somebody who did something we don't, don't like. Just We always just say, well, bless their heart. Because he just kept telling this kid, well, you just wait. Dr. Dean's going to be here in a couple of weeks, and he's covering, he's covering dispensations and covenants, and, and he'll answer all your questions. See, I'll get back at him. I'll tell him Bruce is older than me. See, we always have this this thing going back and forth with the students as to something we have uh, with them, and we'll we'll we play tricks on each other and things. And so there's always this thing: who's older? I always tell him it's Bruce. Bruce is five years younger than I am, but we won't tell anybody. So anyhow, th- it goes back. This is a basic problem. It's a hermeneutical issue in Genesis. Uh, in Genesis. 17, God said that, uh, that the land would be bordered, or excuse me, Genesis 15, that the bo- land would be bordered by the river Euphrates and by the Mediterranean. And they've never fully taken control of that land. Well, what happens when you get into the New Testament, when you start shifting into this more allegorical or spiritualized uh, approach to Scripture, that Israel becomes the church, is that the promised land, the literal, physical, geographical land, becomes heaven. Wait a minute. How did, would Abraham have understood that? Did God change the meaning? Is God sort of a bait and switch? I'm going to promise you physical land and physical property, but now instead I'm going to switch it. And it's going to be heaven. I'm going to tell you your people are the physical, your physical descendants, and now I'm going to switch it. It's going to be only spiritual descendants. What What's... Um, we can't do that and be consistent in understanding the Scripture. So that's one of the important uh, factors to remember here is again and again and again, as we go through Genesis, and we did this in, this in our study of Genesis, God reiterates the same promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to Joseph to make sure we all understand what the promise is and to whom the promise is given. And that promise is oriented to inheriting or possessing the land, a specific piece of real estate, and it remained a promise, an unfulfilled promise, a future-oriented promise to the, in, in the lives of all four of these patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, and Joseph. But God gave it to them, but they never saw it as there. They never... Uh, they never possessed it. And so we see in Genesis 28, 1 through 4, that in this second blessing that Isaac gives to Jacob, he is reiterating the Abrahamic covenant and the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, and that these are for Jacob as the younger who is to be served by his older brother. And so what happens after this is that Jacob is going to have to to leave. So let's just have a quick two-point summary. The two-point summary of this is that, first of all, the focus of this promise, uh, the, the, the focus of the promise that God gave to Abraham is the land, the land, the land. The focus is on the land. 
The second aspect of the blessing emphasized the seed promise that out from Abraham would come many nations, out from uh, Jacob would come an assembly of people. So it emphasizes those two aspects of the Abrahamic covenant, the aspect of the land and the seed, and of course, both involve the third aspect, which is which is blessing. And all of these were future to Isaac. They were all future to Jacob. They're all future to Joseph, but and they never saw them. But their focus was on the things to come. Their focus was on the eventual fulfillment in eternity, and they had to learn to live in light of that future promise of God so that understanding what the future held was to have a, an effect coming back on them in how they lived. It doesn't always, and it didn't always for them, and it doesn't always for us, but that's our point of contact for application is we have to learn to live in light of the promise that God has given us and the destiny that he has for us. So here we have a map of the area of the land of Canaan. The two circles indicate the two key locations that come up later on in chapter 28, Beersheba in the south, which is where uh, Isaac and Rebekah are living at the time of the uh, inheritance blessing statements in chapter uh, chapter 27. And so Jacob is going to get up and leave from there and to head north to his uncle Laban, the son of Beth, Bethuel, uh, the Syrian. And then something is going to happen to him as he is heading out of the land. He comes to the area of the Canaanite city of Luz, which becomes renamed Bethel. This is the same place to which his uh, grandfather Abraham had come when he entered into the land and had erected an altar there. And if you look at the two lines that are going up there, the blue line stands out more than the green line, but the blue line is the path of Jacob's departure as he heads north, and then the green line is the path of his return. And so you see that along the path that he's going to exit the land, and return to the land along the same route and go through the same areas. And in both cases, he he is going to be involved in uh, an episode that occurs in uh, Bethel. So what we have to recognize here is that the, the point of application for us that comes out of this is that we are to hang in there just as these Old Testament patriarchs hung in there, never saw the promise, but maintained their faithfulness, their uh, trust in God, their trust in the promise. We are not to uh, give up. We're not to yield to temptation, to give up or to give in, but we're to press on to endurance. Now, this is going to be developed more fully in the next chapter in Hebrews. We're in Hebrews 11, which is an application section, an exhortation section. Chapter 12 is a repeat a second exhortation section. And so just to give you a little preview of things to come, Hebrews 12, 3 and 4 states, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. See, we have an example from the Old Testament. They did not, they hung in there. Now, there were times they got, they, they fell off, uh, off the path but they got back on. There were times they were weary. There were times that they disobeyed God, but the overall orientation of their life was to focus on the promise. So we're to take heart from that and not to uh, grow weary, discouraged. Ultimately, it is the example of the Lord Jesus Christ who went through even more difficulty than anyone else, and he did not give up. He did not become weary or discouraged and neither should we. So that's the basis for the exhortation there in verses 3 and 4. Consider him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted to bloodshed or striving in your striving against sin. We have to hang in there. Now the next verse in Hebrews is Hebrews 11.21, which focuses on Jacob's blessing to his sons. For by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on top of his staff. Now when we come out of 
11.20, and we're focusing on the initial blessing, we see Jacob is the last person that we think of that is properly oriented to God or to God's plan. So what happens between verse 20 and verse 21 is monumental. That's between chapters uh, 28 and roughly 35. We see the spiritual growth of, of, of uh, Jacob. And this is important for us to understand in terms of a lesson because what happens between the, his exit from the land and uh, his return to the land is that God works in his life to produce discipline and maturity. When he leaves, he's undisciplined. He is, he's the trickster. He's trying to find the shortcut path to uh, the blessing. He's not willing to wait on the Lord or to uh, trust the Lord. He is the heel grabber, the swindler, the manipulator, and he has yet to understand the grace of God or orient to, his, uh, to God's plan or to his promises. Now, when we think about promises and think about how we are to orient to promises, beyond just simply the act of claiming them in the faith rest drill, but the promises focus on a future, and that future is to shape our present reality. We are so convinced of the fulfillment of the promise that it shapes our thinking, our motivation, and our drive in the present. And this is what enables us to mature. Now, some years ago, I heard someone make the observation that the real key to maturity is the ability to postpone gratification. Now, if you have that as your definition, we live in an immature culture because nobody in our culture wants to postpone gratification. But that's really what maturity is. Maturity postpones gratification because you understand there are greater goals and greater objectives. Your focus is on the future, and you're not just living in the present. You understand that the present is moving in a direction of of future fulfillment. So as we mature, whether it's in uh, general emotional maturation process or spiritual maturity, we learn to postpone gratification, which means we have to be patient in life and we have to learn to orient to God's plan and to God's timing. Now, this is a real problem for Jacob because Jacob is impatient. He wants it now. He wants it his way according to his his timing. And so in order to learn to postpone that gratification and to uh, relax and be patient, God has to bring some discipline into Jacob's life and into Jacob's thinking. And the only way that we can truly focus on the future, the only way we can live in light of our eternal destiny, is when we get to the point where we can discipline our thinking to focus on doctrine when everything around us is falling apart and everything's going to hell in a handbasket and everything is in chaos, we are not going to take our eyes off of the Lord. We're not going to take our eyes off the promise because that becomes our reality. It's more real to us than all of the other nonsense that goes on around us. And so the key here is going to be discipline. Now, I'm bringing this in now at this stage because this too is where we're headed in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, where at, right after the two verses I cited a minute ago in Hebrews uh, uh, 12, 3, and 4, and 5 through 7, there's a quote from the Old Testament, and we get into the importance of God's discipline in the believer's life. So I'll be talking more and more about that to bring, try to bring our attention on what it means to be a disciplined believer. So let's just have a little four-point introduction to the doctrine of discipline. First of all, whenever we use the word, we have a problem. And that, ba- that basic problem is that too often we think of discipline as being equivalent to punishment. And we use it that way a lot, and it, in many contexts it is uh, synonymous with punishment. But that's only the negative side of discipline. Uh, reason we think of it as punishment is because we often learn and we acquire self-discipline only by facing negative consequences. Only as we learn uh, by our mistakes 
either through the natural consequences of bad decisions, things fall apart, things don't work, or there's the additional compound of divine discipline, divine punishment, on top of the negative consequences of our bad decisions. Now, <clears throat> the problem is that discipline isn't just a negative of punishment, but that is a major feature of it. So the second point is to look at the word in terms of its basic meaning. And so I looked this up in the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED, and saw that the noun discipline is defined as the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior. To train the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior. And just think about that in terms of anything that you've ever tried to accomplish in life. You've had to learn to follow a, a precise set of, of procedures in order to accomplish the goal, whether it's in athletics or whether it is in some form of, of the arts, in dance, in uh, speaking, in any number of different things, you have to learn a measure of discipline and to discipline oneself in order to achieve the goal. When you're involved in athletics, you're involved in the military, you're involved in academics, you have to postpone gratification. There has to be uh, that aspect of self-control. There are certain rules that you have to learn and have to follow in order to be a success in anything. Uh, people can't be a success just by saying, oh, I want to go out and I want to do this with, and do it in an undisciplined manner without following certain, uh, certain rules or certain procedures. So when we apply this to the spiritual life, what we see is that what God is doing in disciplining us is instilling in our thinking, in our life, uh, the the modus operandi of following the rules or the code of behavior, where we're living life on the basis of God's values and God's standards. So the the noun focuses on the practice of training people, and in the church age, one of the r ways in which God trains believers and is to discipline believers in that sense of training them to obey rules and a code of conduct is through the pastor teacher teaching from the Word of God in the local church. But that's just one element. That's how we find out what the rules and the code of behavior are. Then we, the, the verb means to train someone to obey the rules or the code of behavior by punishment or rebuke. So that's the verbal aspect is to train somebody through the use of punishment or, rebu or, or rebuke. And this is what often happens when uh, you get into athletics or you get in the military and you do something wrong and the coach makes you do push-ups or the sergeant makes you do push-ups or various other negative consequences that teach you uh, very quickly to not break the rules. So that's the idea. It's training in a code of conduct. Now, this fits very well with the terminology that's used in the Scripture. We have both Greek and Hebrew words that uh, will need to be studied a little more fully as we get into this. The Greek word, it, the verb is paiduo, and the noun is paideia, which come from the root word that has to do with a child. So it's ultimately related to child training. Paiduo means to bring up, for example, bring up a child, to give them instruction, to train them, to educate them. So that's all part of the idea in, in discipline. It's not just uh, negative consequences. It's instruction. It is uh, develop, it's education. It's developing uh, character, understanding of why things are done the way they should be done. And uh, paideia, the noun, is indicates the idea of training, instruction, and discipline as well. So when we think about divine discipline, divine discipline isn't just the negative of divine punishment for uh, wrong behavior, but it is training. God is involved in training us. So the focus uh, and, uh, on the end result is the idea of training, preparation for future service, future service as a mature believer now, and future service on into the millennium and on into the future. Now, the Hebrew word that shows up is a word that comes that's found in Proverbs three eleven and twelve. 
This is what's quoted in Hebrews chapter uh, 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So here we see that part of love involves the negative of chastening and reproof. These are not pleasant. And and correction, but that's what part of what the Word of God does. Uh, the Word of God is inspired and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. This is not not always pleasant. The word that's translated chastening in 311 is the Hebrew word uh, moser. And it's interesting because the literal meaning of the word is to, describes a band or a bond, something that restricts someone. You may capture a prisoner and put him in bonds, a chain, something of that nature. So figuratively, it was used for something that uh, is used in chastening or restraining. And that fits the idea of, of self-discipline. Self-discipline means that we are learning to restrain our lust patterns. We're uh, learning to restrain our uh, desires for immediate gratification. We have to discipline ourselves according to a certain uh, code code of conduct to restrain our natural impulses and the driving uh, lust patterns of the sin nature. So... The idea of chastening is, is to bring control, self-control, into the uh, life of the believer. The second, uh, another word that's used in this passage in Proverbs 3.12, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects, is the Hebrew word uh, yaka, which means to decide or to judge or to prove or rebuke or reprove or correct. All of those are very close ideas, judging or deciding in the sense of reproving or, or correcting. So God is in that process of reproving or correcting us in order to instill uh, that discipline. And the fourth point is simply that it's part of God's plan in every dispensation to train believers to think and to live according to His code of conduct. In the Old Testament, that code of conduct was expressed from the time of Moses on in terms of the Mosaic Law. And in the New Testament, it's expressed in the law of love, the law of Christ that are uh, described through all of the uh, positive mandates in the uh, New Testament as well as the various negative prohibitions. Positively, some of these include that we are to love one another. We've done an extensive study of that. We are to be gracious to one another, forgiving one another, as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us or been gracious to us. We're to pray without ceasing. We're to walk by the Spirit. We're to rejoice always. Uh, we're to cast our cares upon Him. These are all part of those positive mandates that are, God is will, trying to instill in us and get us to make a part of our regular disciplined uh, behavior. Then we have the negatives. Uh, do not gossip. Do not lie dealing with certain sin- sins of the tongue. Don't give up. Don't fade out. Don't grow weary as we saw in Hebrews 12, 3 and, uh, 3 and 4. Do not be judgmental. That's really the best nuance of that uh, well-known verse. Uh, don't judge lest you be judged. The idea there isn't making an evalu- evaluative or discerning decision. It's against being judgmental in the sense of putting yourself in the place of God and condemning someone as only God can uh, can do, putting yourself in the place of being the divine judge. Uh, being angry and do not sin, Ephesians chapter 4. Do not worry. These are all part of the negative uh, prohibitions, uh, behavior, unacceptable behavior uh, in the spiritual life. So as we go through life, we face a variety of experiences that under the sovereignty of God are designed for us. They, they may not be so great for somebody else, but they are what God has uh, directed us to under His sovereignty. There's no accidents in the plan of God. And so both the good things that we experience and the adverse things are designed by God to teach us to focus on Him in the midst of adversity, in the midst of crisis, to uh, put our, our blinders on, to, to narrow our vision down, just focus on what is, what's, what the Word of God says. 
uh, one of the things that happens whenever a person is in a life-threatening situation is that the the blood begins to flow to the center uh, mass of the body. It doesn't go to the outer e- extremities a lot, so manual dexterity is lost, and some other things are lost because the body goes into this fight-or-flight syndrome where all of that, everything is focused down to the center uh, for survival, and this also affects eyesight, so the tunnel vision will will develop. and And sometimes I forget the technical term for it now, but sometimes it seems as if there is a slowdown of motion. Uh, people get in certain uh, really intense, life threatening s- situations, and they report that it just seems as if everything slowed down, and and they lost peripheral vision. Everything focused on the 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 threat itself. Well, that is what should take place spiritually, is as we get into crises and get into adversity and we uh, are just at the point of being overwhelmed, we should be so focused on the Word and the promises of God and the future that God has for us and what He's doing in training us that we get this tunnel vision on our spiritual life and focusing on the Word and on the fulfillment of of, of those promises. And so God takes us through these various drills in life, various experiences in life in order to uh, teach us and to train us uh, for our future role of service. And that's what he did with Jacob. And we've gone through the chapters of, Jake, of Genesis where we see Jacob learning uh, how to control his own desires to manipulate and control life, to manipulate uh, God to his own benefit. Uh, after he manipulated the blessing away from Esau, he had to flee for his life, not a really good consequence, and he ends up with his relative Laban who is going to outfox the fox. And Laban is the chiseler's chief chiseler, and he's going to always manage to one-up Jacob. Now, we're only given a few examples, and the uh, prime one, of course, is what happens when uh, Jacob makes a deal. He barters, works out a good deal, he thinks, with Uncle Laban for his daughter Rachel, who Jacob is in love with. And so after he works for seven years, and and, uh, Laban gets the benefit of, of Jacob's work, uh, he gets married, and he discovers after the wedding night that that uh, Laban pulled a fast one on him, substituted the older daughter Leah for Rachel, and Jacob wakes up in the morning, and he's married to the wrong girl. He's been tricked. The trickster has been tricked, and so he goes back to Laban. He has to work out another deal another seven years. See, God's teaching him patience. He has to keep working there in those unpleasant circumstances to learn to relax and to trust in God's plan and God's timing. And so during this time, he has uh, various children. He has the 12 sons and one daughter, uh, Dinah, and God is, is blessing him. But the love of his life is Rachel, and Rachel is unable to have children. Finally, she has a son. She has uh, Joseph. And then at the end, she will have one, one more son, Benjamin, and then die shortly thereafter as a result of complications with the uh, childbirth. And so through this time, we see the adversity, the difficulties, we see humility develop in, in uh, Jacob. And we, learn, we see that he's learning to trust God, not to try to manipulate things himself, but to relax in letting God uh, control things. And the ultimate example that we're given is when Jacob goes through this really obscure s- situation that's described in, uh, in Genesis where he makes this deal with Laban that, uh, he, he can, um, that Laban will let him leave if, if he takes care of the flocks a certain way. And he enters into this deal with the breeding of the sheep where he he creates this, uh, he negotiates the deal so that it looks to Laban like Laban's going to get the the better end of this deal. He Laban must have walked away from this saying, "What a fool Jacob is!" And the the deal was that all of the speckled and spotted uh, goats or sheep and the black sheep, and the, this would be the recessive genes, so there were fewer of these, that all of those that were born would go to to Jacob and the uh, the others would go to Laban. 
And so Laban says, okay, that's a, that's a great deal, and he's chuckling to himself because he knows that the predominant uh, color of the, the, the sheep uh, is going to be uh, other colors in the speckled and spotted. So he moves all of his sheep three days away to make sure that there's no way that his uh, the speckled and spotted black sheep that he already has are going to uh, hook up with, with uh, Jacob's sheep. And Jacob goes into this really odd thing where he, he takes a stick and he strips off the bark. Now, when you strip off the bark and you expose the white uh, uh, core of the tree underneath that, there's kind of a play on words because the Hebrew word for white is Laban. And so he's, there's, you know, the Holy Spirit's making a little pun there because he's going to expose Laban, basically. And, and what God does is God overrides the situation and causes a tremendous number of births of spotted, speckled, and black sheep and goats so that uh, Jacob's herds just increase and Laban's don't and Laban's out there. And God has blessed Jacob rather than Laban getting it through, uh, through manipulation. And this leads ultimately to the fact that now Jacob wants to leave and go home. Laban's been trying to do all these things to keep him from leaving. And so Jacob ha- has to s- sneak out and to get away and to make his way back home. Now, all, all of this shows the spiritual growth and maturity that took place in Jacob's life at, from the time he left the land until the time that he returned to the land. But at both ends, you have events that occur at Bethel which are very important for understanding the whole role of promise and fulfillment in the life and in the thinking of Jacob. In Genesis 28, where we've been, uh, Jacob heads out. He stops at, at, um, at Bethel, and the Lord appears to him uh, while he is sleeping at night, and he has this dream of a stairway or ladder to heaven, and uh, there are angels of God that are ascending and descending on it. This is one of only two places in the Scripture where you have this phrase, angels, plural, of God, and both occur in episodes in Jacob's life. Uh, verse uh, 13 says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give to you and your descendants. Abrahamic covenants being reconfirmed. Uh, Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we have land, seed, and blessing all reconfirmed in these two verses. Then in the next couple of verses, we read, Behold, I am with you, God says, and will keep you wherever you go. He's on his way out. He's going to be going into the uh, land of of Laban, the land outside the land, and God says, even though you're leaving the land, I'll be with you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Now, this has a major impact on on Jacob's way of thinking because God blesses him and reconfirms the covenant to him. And in verse 16, we read, Then Jacob woke up, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Uh, that's verse 16. In verse 17, we see his response also is he was afraid. And this isn't just a matter of fear or superstition. He is afraid because of the appearance of God. And we know from a variety of passages, Proverbs 1, seven being simply one of them, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so Jacob, this is his first spiritual jolt that occurs at Bethel, where he realizes God really has a plan for his life and God really is in control. Now, that forms the entry point of his spiritual growth as he goes out into his time with Laban up in the north. And then when he returns, he is going to be directed by God in Genesis chapter 35 to go back to Bethel. He has an episode at... uh, there's an episode where he goes to a place called Peniel. He names Peniel in the Transjordan area as he returns 
uh, back to the land, and he meets God uh, face to face there in Genesis chapter 32. But in Genesis chapter 35, God instructs him to return to Bethel, rise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And so he then sanctifies the family. They have to put away all the teraphim, the foreign gods that they have, uh, their little idols. They had to purify themselves, change their garments, and prepare to go and worship the Lord at Bethel. What happens at Bethel? Well, God is going to reconfirm the covenant, verses 10 through 12. God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. This is the transformation spiritually. No longer is he called the chiseler, the manipulator, the swindler. Now he's going to be known as a leader or prince with God. Uh, the name Israel, meaning that he is uh, the, the prince of God. Also God said to him, verse 11, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you, I give this land. So again, we have the reiteration of the promise at the beginning and at the end, but there's no fulfillment. The promise isn't being fulfilled in his lifetime. It is still future. There is still a future orientation for him, and he has to live in light of that, uh, that future promise. And then we go over to um, look at Genesis. Uh, well, one other place we'll, we'll end up with tonight. In Second Peter 1, 3, ties all this together, taking us to the New Testament and to the purpose of promises. It's related to God's character, His essence, His power at the very beginning of the verse, and it is related to our uh, sanctification, the last part of the verse. In Second Peter 1, 3, Peter writes, As His divine power has given to us all things. So the beginning, the focal point, is on the power of God, and He has given us all things. Whenever we have that verb to give, uh, the Greek word didomi, always emphasizes grace when God is the... Uh, the actor, when God is the giver. His divine power has given to us all things. And then there's a qualifier that pertain to life and godliness. Now, there's two different words there that are used in the Greek. And the word there for life has to do with the physical life. And the word for godliness has to do with the spiritual life, eusebeia. It's a godliness is an old English word. It means godlikeness. Well, we are to become like God. That was the idea in that word because God is conforming us to the image of Christ. So that has to, that is a word that describes our entire uh, spiritual life. So he's given us everything that is related to life and godliness. And how do we get there? What's the intermediate means? Through the knowledge of Him. So we activate what He's given us through the knowledge of Him, through the knowledge of God. That means we have to study the Word. We have to know the Word. We have to come to not just know the Word as an academic study, but know the God who revealed Himself in the Word. It is that personal relationship with God that is mediated through His Word. So we have to learn His Word, learn about Him, come to know Him, not just in the sense of knowing uh, things about Him, but come to know Him. And then He's further defined as the one who called us by glory and virtue. That is, the integrity of His character lies behind the relationship that we have with Him. So it's a certain sealed relationship. Then in verse 4 we read, by which, that is by the glory and virtue, by his character, by his integrity, we have been give, it has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. This is a fantastic statement here that recognizes the value of the promises of Scripture that go to every one of us. He's given us these promises that... For a purpose, that through these, that is, that through the, these promises, through their use in the faith rest drill, 
claiming promises, but through a recognition that a promise also focuses our attention on future fulfillment. It's that uh, certain expectation of our hope that we can live today in light of eternity, that through these promises we may become partakers of the divine nature. And what that means is that that by claiming the promises, living in light of that reality, that God is transforming us into the character of Christ. This isn't a mystical idea that somehow uh, we become more and more divine. It is the idea that we reflect his character as we are conformed to the image of Christ more and more in the process of our spiritual growth. Because the choices are either claim the promise and obey God, postpone gratification, be disciplined in our spiritual life, or just fulfill the lust patterns of our soul, just run off doing everything we want to in immediate gratification. How do we escape the corruption that's in the world by lust? It's by claiming the promises, living today in light of reality, focusing on the future so that the present circumstances are diminished because the future is more real to us than anything that's going on in our immediate vicinity. And so this is the importance of the promises. Now, next time we'll come back. We'll carry this through into the prophecies that Jacob gave. I um, mean, Jacob as Israel to his sons and the 12 tribes and uh, at the end of Genesis. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be challenged by these things, to study uh, what you have done in the past, to hold up these witnesses in their life. These were men who were not always successful in obeying you. They are like us. They are they have sin natures, they have many failures, yet there were key times and key situations in which they uh, trusted you, and they learned slowly but surely to grow. They learned to uh, take the steps whereby they uh, trusted you, they focused on the future, they focused on your reality, they focused on your plan, they focused on your procedures, and they focused on the fact that you would eventually fulfill those promises. In the same way we need to do that today, we need to learn to focus not on the present unpleasant realities in our life, but to focus on what you are doing in us as we learn to deal with these situ situations and circumstances on the basis of your word. And we pray that God the Holy Spirit would help make those promises more real to us than anything else that we face in life. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.